right, as of now, um, check, check, okay. All right, I reckon everything is all right. So we've got so many different people from all over the world, including Mars, beautiful, beautiful. Those infamous engineers from Mars, right? So I'm glad that you joined. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, and welcome to a very interesting journey into the world of reverse engineering. So before we get started, I'd like to mention that today's webinar is translated into several different languages. So this particular one is, is translated into Korean and Japanese. So if you are interested, please check out the chat and you'll find more information about that. And also I'd like to mention that this event is a joint venture of two partner companies. First of all, it's Artfake 3D, which I proudly represent, a 3D scanning and 3D processing software producer as well as Octon, a software company that develops AI-driven software for the manufacturing industry, including the market-leading uh, solution for reverse engineering, which is DesignX, the one that we will discuss in full length later on in this session. So just a few words about our agenda for today, about the plans that we have. Um, since reverse engineering is a fairly complex subject, I would like to start out uh, with a number of whys and hows prior to moving forward to the real world examples. So we'll discuss all the theoretical questions that are related to reverse engineering. We'll begin with the very basics, making sure we understand the purpose uh, as well as the tool set of reverse engineering. On top of that, we'll discuss different reverse engineering scenarios and approaches, which is really important. These are pretty universal. So whatever industry you're working with or whatever part you're working with, you'll be able to implement these strategies uh, in your projects and in your workflow. Having gotten this out of the way, uh, we'll explore our first reverse engineering solution for today, which will be Artec Studio. In fact, I will briefly show you what it takes to digitize an item, uh, meaning that we'll go from scanning to processing to reverse engineering, so that you have like the, the full grasp of what it takes to actually do the whole thing with a 3D scanner. And after that, I will pass the microphone to uh, my Octon counterpart, Guido Hans, a gentleman who has practiced reverse engineering for about 20 years now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, actually, as we established a couple of days ago, I was still in the kindergarten when Guido was using a vintage 3D scanner to reverse engineer his first item. So you can expect some found knowledge and a lot of useful information for sure. Under Guido's leadership, we will explore um, Geomagic for SolidWorks, DesignX software solution, and yeah, he'll show you all the tips and tricks and everything it takes to reverse engineer an advanced kind of item. Yeah, and once it's all done, we will do a very quick summary and move on to the Q&A session. So I think it's needless to say that we will be delighted to answer whatever questions that you have related to reverse engineering. So if you have any, please write them down in the chat. Uh, we've got the moderators that will kind of pin your questions and they will uh, show them to us afterwards once we're done with all that stuff. Okay, also a quick reminder, you will get the recording. If you're signed up, you will get the recording and all the models that we have used in this webinar. So please don't forget to uh, sign in like officially through the link. All right. Uh, and by the way, as you might have figured this is not going to be like a half an hour brief overview of the topic. We'll get into pretty intricate details of the subject. So you should expect like about two hours worth of content. So please bear with us. All right, without further ado, let's begin with the very basics of reverse engineering. First of all, if you ever try to research the subject, you may have figured that reverse engineering is a fairly broad term that can be applied to several different activities across multiple different domains. People, companies, and even governments, they all practice reverse engineering and they reverse engineer mechanical goods, security system, systems, software products, uh, different types of technology, and even genome structure. But despite such a wide variety uh, of applications of this principle, uh, the main idea of reverse engineering remains the same. Reverse engineering is a process of deconstruction and analysis with the purpose of extraction of design information. So yeah, as simple as that. It enables you to determine how 
the product or a system is designed and most importantly uh, provides you with enough knowledge to reconstruct the same idea and the same design and modify it. Um, reverse engineering of mechanical parts, which is the type we'll focus on today, has been around for decades now. So yeah, let's, let's talk about the benefits of this type of reverse engineering and why people do it first and foremost. The first thing that I'd like to mention is legacy parts digitalization. Um, interestingly enough, a large number of mechanical systems that we will use, that we still use today, they have been developed many years ago. So professionals, professional engineers of those days did their job exactly right, and their ingenious creations are still relevant regardless of the crazy pace that science and technology has been evolving. In some cases, um, the producing companies have ceased to exist entirely, so they, they're not on the market anymore. And in other cases, maybe they are still here, but the blueprints and all the technical documentation is lost. Both of these are a great example of uh, where reverse engineering is much needed. Using a reliable measuring method, any legacy system can be redocumented and properly stored according to our day and age in a digital format. This technical documentation normally includes 3D models, assemblies, blueprints, specifications, um, like exploded view drawings, stress analysis results, and many other things, depending on the particular project. By reverse, engineer, re reverse engineering and redocumenting the system, a company brings their existing products into a united digital environment and makes sure there is a digital 3D record of their entire product line. The second reason why people and companies practice reverse engineering is legacy parts replacement. Uh, and this is probably the most obvious uh, use for reverse engineering technology. Uh, like I said, both companies and individuals, they may face a pretty tricky situation when a particular part of an assembly or of a mechanism is broken. And worst off, there is no way you can buy it. So yeah, it's either not produced anymore or you just cannot seem to get hold of the item. Um, and since, since it cannot be simply replaced by the off-the-shelf solution, by, by similar product or that exact product, our best bet is to reverse engineer and produce it ourselves. It is by no means a simple task because some parts are extremely complex, uh, but if done properly, it can save you both time and money. Um, lots of great examples of this could be found in automotive industry, for example. So spare parts for classic cars are very rare as well as expensive. So reverse engineering them via 3D scanning has proven to be a very effective solution. All right, reason number three is parts improvement. So asking the original producer of the item to modify it so that it fits your, your needs uh, is rarely a relevant option, right? Because it definitely costs a lot. So unless you are willing to pay a high price for it, you will not be able to, um, to modify your item through the official producer. So enhancing existing parts is another great application uh, of reverse engineering. Before introducing any changes to, to the item, we first need to generate a proper parametric 3D model, which can be altered to fit our needs. And afterwards, we can modify it um, and then 3D print, mill, or produce in any other way uh, to replace the original item. By the way, when doing so, we should always keep in mind the uh, prospective copyright laws, yeah, to avoid any potential legal issues, obviously. Uh, the other thing which I'd like to mention is failure analysis and diagnosis. Sometimes the exact reason behind a mechanism failure is just not obvious. And the puzzle can still be solved if you reverse engineer the entire system and see how it works and identify where the problem is. So to analyze it properly and identify the malfunction, reverse engineering can be used as well. Competitor analysis. Um, you know, companies very rarely admit that they do it, but they certainly employ reverse engineering for achieving market dominance. 
simply getting access to a competitor's product is just rarely enough. To conduct a proper research, companies need to uh, break a product down into smaller pieces. They need to see what it does, see what components it has, and kind of figure out how it works in general. And reverse engineering of a particular part or the entire mechanism is an essential part of competitor analysis, which help businesses a lot to understand the market and make sure they offer the best product or the best experience to their customers. And last but not least, value analysis. So a common business practice of deconstruction and analysis of a product in order to find opportunities for cost cutting. This is what value analysis is generally. And uh, today in our fast paced society, companies often need to kind of reflect on what they have produced already in order to see if the same product or the same system can be produced more effectively and more inexpensively. Uh, yeah, needless to say, they do it because they, they, they want to improve their position on the market uh, and reverse engineering is of great assistance here as well. So these six points that I've made, they should give you like a good idea of why we do reverse engineering, even though the list may not necessarily include all potential reasons to utilize it. Uh, on our website, which is artic3d.com slash cases, we have a selection of uh, fascinating case studies where people and companies share their stories of how they implement reverse engineering to address their problems. So if you're interested in real life cases from a variety of different industries, feel free to visit and check it out. Okay, now let's talk about reverse engineering and how it's performed. You know, essentially the whole process of reverse engineering consists of two major steps. The first one being measuring or acquiring information about the object. And the second one is modeling or producing a parametric 3D model or a blueprint, depending on the project. Like we established earlier, the need for reverse engineering has been around for a long time, meaning that engineers of the past had to handle this situation in their unique way. Um, yeah, definitely they, they could only rely on the technology which was out there back in the day, uh, which uh, these times had to offer. It, long before 3D scanning became a thing, became an accessible technology for everyone to use. Um, and uh, during these days, reverse engineering pioneers had to measure the item manually using conventional mechanical measuring tools such as calipers, gouges, levels, rulers, protractors, and all these other instruments that you can see on the screen right now. After that, a set of blueprints was produced and prototypes were created. As you would imagine, it would take quite a few prototypes until the final model was produced or the final copy was produced, uh, the one that corresponds to the original design with the, the reasonable tolerance. <clears throat> the biggest drawback of this type of approach was uh, accuracy and time, low accuracy for that matter. The next biggest uh, inventions that were set to improve reverse engineering pipeline were CMM machines and CAD software. The former allowed engineers to capture 3D coordinates of particular key points on the object surface very precisely, and then use that information to recreate the object's features in 3D. And CAD software, in turn, introduced a whole new dimension to reverse engineering. The engineers were able to create a fully fledged digital copy of almost any physical object. Uh, and what it did was it ensured more efficient and more importantly, more accurate reverse engineering. But still, there are that many points that you could measure with a probing device. And the number of hours it took to process a complex item was ridiculously high. But as you know, progress never stops. And as soon as, <clears throat> pardon, as soon as new technology arrived, uh, the engineers were able to do the job more effectively. And uh, this new set of technology was nowhere uh, was nothing sure of a match made in heaven. It was a 3D scanning technology and reverse engineering software, which kind of sort of branched out uh, of conventional CAD. Yeah, uh, and the first 3D scanners that were available to the engineers, uh, they couldn't boast a huge number of points captured per second, definitely. 
uh, but still they were much faster than CMMs uh, as far as data uh, acquisition speed was concerned. But as years pass by, we, know, we now have access to spectacular 3D scanning devices that are capable of capturing millions upon millions of points every second and uh, are impressively accurate, mobile and much more affordable than the professional CMM machines. Throughout the help of 3D scanning um, and 3D scanner technology, we can capture the entire surface within just a few moments and uh, we can figure out the coordinates of millions upon millions of points every second without the need to manually measure anything or probing anything. But proper accurate reverse engineering wouldn't be possible without high-end software. Certain modern reverse engineering packages, they offer functionality which is very unique and helps you uh, to identify the features of the object and to reverse engineer the shape entirely with extremely high precision. So now it's time for us to discuss the different shape types and the, all the reverse engineering scenarios that are related to a shape type. You know, even though there's a huge variety of shapes when it comes to mechanical parts, uh, we can, as far as reverse engineering is concerned, we can divide them into three specific groups. So I'd like you to take a look at this picture right here. If you look at every item closely, you can tell that there is a particular idea behind every element and feature. They were not just freely drawn with some sort of a 3D pencil uh, or formed like we do with the Play-Doh, right? Instead, they were created with one of the basic CAD operations such as extrusion, revolution, loft, etc. They can also be represented by either one or a combination of several so-called primitive geometric shapes cylinders, cones, spheres, planes, and so on. To the models that are formed by these features, we also refer to as parametric models, meaning that their entire shape is defined by a set of parameters or values that can be freely modified to alter the shape and size of the model. And when it comes to reverse engineering, these shapes are called geometric or mechanical, and they make up the first group of shapes. Now let's look at the another picture. So unlike the previous objects, these shapes could be defined as irregular and complex. They often resemble shapes that are found out in the wild, the ones that are described by the mystical laws of nature instead of a set of particular equations or values. However, these shapes are still used in engineering, meaning that you will need to find a way to reverse engineer them like you do with the mechanical shapes. And these types of objects uh, are referred to as organic shapes. All right. And finally, the third group. As you can see, these items have both features formed in a mechanical way, as well as the ones that are rather organic. This group is essentially a combination of the previous two, and we call it combined shapes. So before engaging into any reverse engineering, uh, it is very important to categorize your item because the tool set and therefore the software that you will, you will need to use depends on the particular category. So before we discuss um, the exact tools, I'd like to establish some general rules, if you don't mind. Uh, these rules and concepts of reverse engineering, every engineer needs to know them, yeah, because they enable easier shape reconstruction. And yeah, this is just basically everything, the most important stuff that you need to know about the entire pipeline. And first and foremost, we need to keep in mind the concepts, the concept of design intent. Uh, reverse engineers, yeah, reverse engineering implies a great deal of shape analysis. And when doing it, it is essential for you to understand that every feature that you will be reverse engineering was created with a particular intent in mind. For you, it means that none of the things that you will be 3D modeling are random. And if it looks like they are, it most definitely means that you're doing something wrong. Design intent, for the most part, deals with an item's function, dimensions, and relationships between its features as well as other components in the same assembly. When thinking about the design intent, uh, try to figure out what exact function the part performs. How is it produced? 
what are the other components that this item uh, interacts with? What environment uh, is this part used in? So all these questions are extremely important. And with this said, the second concept of reverse engineering is consider the constraints. Each of the clues that you get in the process of thinking about the design intent will introduce a specific constraint that will help you to reconstruct the shape properly. If you know that your item is produced in a certain way, uh, it can give you a good idea of what a particular element may or may not, may not be. For example, if you know what, that your particular part is produced through the use of uh, metal casting, then the outer perimeter faces will rarely be perfectly perpendicular, perfectly vertical, uh, because engineers, they create them to have a bit of a draft angle so that it is easier to remove the part from the casting mold. So that, that gives you just some extra information, uh, even without measuring the item. You know for a fact that there will be an angle. And knowing that this part is used, uh, is used for exactly is absolutely essential as well. After all, the entire design was basically defined by the, the item's function. And it will be much easier for you to decipher the design if you know what problem it's supposed to solve. Let's say you are reverse engineering an item with a cylindrical area that looks like a pin of some sort. You measure it first and see that the diameter isn't, perfectly, isn't a perfectly round number, right? It can be some 10, 20, or 30 uh, microns smaller or bigger. And you'll probably fairly assume that this is nothing else but uh, a measuring error. But in fact, there may be one more thing to consider, which is tolerance. The item may have been designed so that the shaft fits the respective holes very tightly, and this way creates the interference fit, or the opposite may have been the case. It was designed um, with the idea that the pin has a smaller size so that the respective hole is slightly bigger and the entire system has a bit of a play. So that, that kind of fit is called clearance fit. Even though there are so many different factors that could have potentially contributed to the imperfection of that particular measurement that you've made, it still helps a lot knowing that this element of the model has this particular function. Also, knowing the exact measuring system uh, is very important. If you look at the numbers, they make no sense whatsoever uh, to an extent that rounding them even to the tenth of a millimeter doesn't help to make it work somehow, you're probably reverse engineering something that was created in inches or vice versa. You're reverse engineering in inches, but it was created in the millimeters. So please make sure that you know which units were used. And uh, concept number three here, or the rule number three, has to do with the error. The thing is, regardless of how accurate the production equipment and your measuring system are, the measured part will never be 100% true to the original design, unfortunately. Um, and let's think about all the potential issues that could have contributed to the, the general error. First, when the original item was produced, um, there was a certain production error involved in the process. And the exact value of this error depended on the production method, uh, quality control policies on the uh, in that particular business and on a few other things. Then, when we uh, get our hands on the item, finally, and we get to measure it, there is another error taking place. Even the most advanced measuring system, they, they still, uh, they're still not perfect. They will allow a certain deviation from the original size. And the better the system that you use, the lower this accuracy error will be. And you can actually bring it all the way down to some negligible numbers if you use proper equipment. But still, there will be some error. And these two factors, uh, they result in an accumulated error that you need to keep in mind. The reason why you should always keep it in mind is because as you will be measuring uh, your part and then rounding the numbers when doing 3D modeling, you should know that you're not changing the item as such. Instead, you are just taking care of the accumulated error on your way to meeting the original design intent of, of the engineer who was engineering the item. The last concept here is uh, the core features of the item or of the object. So analyzing 
geometry and knowing the design intent allows you to identify the key components of your item. These are the features that form the backbone of the whole of your whole model and uh, are, more, are the most important elements of the entire item. Remember that your mission generally is to follow the exact path that the, the engineer creating the item laid down. And uh, if you start reverse engineering from the same starting point as the original uh, engineer, uh, you are highly likely to reverse engineer everything properly and more uh, with higher accuracy in general. So dimensioning will make also much more sense if, you, if, you're, if your starting point is the very same as the starting point of the uh, engineer producing the original item. Okay, so now as we have established the rules and concepts, let's go over the tool set and the approach of reverse engineering. Uh, remember that we have defined three shape types and the approach that we'll be taking actually depends on that particular shape type that you have defined. So, mechanical shapes, first of all. Um, this shapes can be reconstructed through the use of manual approach, hybrid, hybrid approach, or the combination of the two. Right, you can see the, the outline of these two methods on the screen right now. The point of the manual approach is to manually create sketches around the measured model, and this way extract design information. Depending on the software that you use, you may or may not have uh, cross-section cross -section areas as a reference for your sketching. Most of the reverse engineering software packages, they do offer this function. So yeah, it helps you to reduce error pretty dramatically. Uh, to give these sketches or cross-sections the third dimension, you will use one of these basic CAD operations, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, such as extrusion, rotation, sweep, loft, and all the other similar operations. So this is the first approach that you can take. The second approach that you can take to reverse engineering of mechanical parts, mechanical shapes, is the so-called hybrid approach. And this approach revolves around extracting primitive geometric shapes through the use of uh, fitting tools. So you can fit in a primitive such as sphere, cone, cylinder, plane, freeform surface, all the shapes can be quickly extracted from the measured model and uh, then combined with each other through the use of Boolean operations or some other CAD functionality. For organic shapes, okay, now we're done with the mechanical shapes, right? So now we're talking about organic shapes. And with them, everything is both easier and more complex at the same time. So on the one hand, uh, the entire model of organic shape can be easily transformed into a CAD surface through the use of just one function and one button. Um, this function is called auto surfacing. But on the other, on the other side, um, if you require more thorough and accurate surface reconstruction, you're going to need to use multiple uh, manual surfacing tools to get the job done. And while auto surfacing is available mainly, uh, well, almost in any reverse engineering package, regardless of the level of, of that solution. Uh, all the advanced mesh surfacing tools, they are only available in the high-end solutions. Later on in this session, by the way, Guido will show you how to perform this high-end reverse engineering of uh, organic shapes. All right, so when we opt to create an auto surface, um, the algorithm will remodel your entire mesh so that the shape is represented by a certain number of quad patches. This is uh, the example that you can see on the screen right now. So on the right, you can see the, the CAD auto surface, and on the left is the original mesh. The more patches you decide to fit, uh, the more accurate the reconstruction will be. But in the most, uh, it must be said that um, if your model has intricate details, they are unlikely to be reconstructed properly by the reasonable by any reasonable number of patches, uh, which outlines the main drawback of the auto surfacing approach, which is fairly low accuracy. All right, now elaborate mesh surfacing in turn provides much more accurate results and generally revolves around manual creation of the model's wireframe and then filling the space between the edges with uh, respective surfaces. 
Okay, so these are the two approaches that you can employ when reverse engineering organic shapes. And now let's talk about the third type of shapes, hybrid shapes. Um, as you might have gathered, we're going to need to use both a uh, set of tools that we use for mechanical parts and for organic parts uh, with combined projects. So first of all, you'll need to employ um, the hybrid approach or the, the other one uh, to reverse engineer the mechanical shapes. And then you need to take care about the second part of the object, which is a, a organic shape. You can use auto surface, you can use all the advanced surfacing tools, and then you combine it all together. These projects tend to be the, the trickiest ones, right? Okay, so these are the approaches to reverse engineering, depending on the shape. Let, now let's just quickly reflect on everything that we have talked about so far. We have discussed that reverse engineering um, is a very interesting subject, which has been around for quite a while. We established how it's used um, by different companies, different individuals. Uh, now we figured how it used to be done and how we do it nowadays. We have gone over the shape types and scenarios. We also outlined the main rules and concepts of reverse engineering. And finally, we defined the reverse engineering approaches and tool sets depending on the shape type of the model. Okay, so remember, uh, before we can get to modeling, we need to do the measuring first, right? And in this part of the event, I'd like to show you how we measure parts using a 3D scanning technology, uh, what we do to transform that raw data that we capture into a fine polygonal mesh, and what reverse engineering tools our Artex software has to offer. So for data acquisition in this particular demonstration, we're using Artec Leo. This is our Flagman mobile 3D uh, scanner with very impressive scanning capabilities. And for processing, obviously, we're going to use our 3D scanning and 3D processing solution, Artec Studio. So, all right, so check out this video right here. To pick up every tiny little detail of this component, we created three scans of the object. It is a flange of some sort. And as you can tell, no special targets uh, had to be used, right? The scene is completely clear um, for tracking and for scanning. We relied on the original texture and uh, geometry features of the object itself and of the scene in general. So after that, once the raw data was acquired, we wirelessly transferred uh, the raw data set into Arc Studio. And this is what it looked like at first, you can see on the screen. Starting from here, we generally have two options when it comes to Arctic Studio. We can either use autopilot and kind of automate the entire process, letting the algorithm figure out all the necessary parameters. Um, this solution will require us just answering a few questions about the model, such as the size of the model, the quality of geometrical details, yeah, just a few small questions. And then we press process and the entire item will be processed, giving you the final result. And the second option is do everything manually step by step. So this kind of approach gives you more, uh, more control over the parameters, right? And generally this approach is employed by uh, more experienced uh, engineers, right? For this particular example that we have right here, we will take the manual path actually. So let me show you how we do it. All right, so at the very first step, we need to align these three scans, right? I'm gonna go for the manual alignment, uh, which is achieved through connection of uh, three point pairs. We also have auto alignment option. And when we have more than three scans, uh, we normally go for auto alignment, but yeah, in this example, I will align them manually. So I will align them one by one. Uh, now we have only three scans, so it shouldn't take too long. And by the way, the reason why we decided to go for three instead of just two is because we wanted to have one more extra scan that captures both inside and the outside surfaces of the item, because that way we have uh, a larger overlap between the areas, which always helps to align everything properly and to register everything more precisely, right? Okay, so, and this is 
the very first step, which again can be automated, uh, especially if you have more than three scans, because some projects they are quite massive and uh, they require uh, capturing of lots and lots of scans. So once the alignment is done, the first algorithm that you need to run is called global registration. And this algorithm is essentially responsible for very precise alignment of every single frame with respect to each other. So right here, the algorithm connects everything by these geometric and texture features extremely precisely. And this is uh, the last preparation step before creating the mesh itself. Okay, it's gonna take a few seconds to complete. All right. Yeah, and now we're going to create uh, the, the mesh, or as we call it, the fusion. In Arctic Studio, we have several different uh, fusion types. So depending on the shape of your item, we will go for a specific one. So here I'm going to employ sharp fusion. And on this stage, the, the set of raw scans will be transformed into a fine polygonal mesh with all the intricate details of this mesh outlined before I, uh, because I uh, went for the sharp fusion option which kind of outlines all these nice geometrical features. So yeah, let's give it a few seconds uh, for the fusion to appear. And uh, when it's done, we are technically ready to start reverse engineering. There are some other extra steps that you could make. For example, you can simplify your mesh, you can optimize it, you can delete certain features, because you can smooth certain areas. So a lot of different things that you can do if you need to, but theoretically, once the mesh is produced, you're ready to go. Reverse engineering can be started right from here. Okay, so this is <clears throat> the final mesh. And let me show you uh, the, the polygons. So I'm going to switch to wire over solid mode. And these are these tiny little triangles that our surface is made of. Okay. When processing is done, and that was processing basically of raw data set into a fine polygonal mesh, uh, when it's done, we can start reverse engineering. At this point, we are reviewing a scenario when we don't have any other software, uh, any other pieces of software, but, but Arctic Studio available. Remember, I was talking about a one button mesh to CAD transformation solution, um, that, that one that fits the organic shapes specifically. Arctic Studio offers auto surface feature that creates CAD surface of any polygonal mesh uh, or a part of the mesh, because you can select a certain area that you would like to transform into CAD uh, with a selected number of patches. So only one setting virtually. Let me show you the auto surfacing in Arctic Studio. Um, I will be auto surfacing this mechanical part, which is not something that we normally do, yeah, because it's a mechanical shape. Well, you know what, in some cases, you may want to create uh, the CAD environment around the item that you're actually reverse engineering. And when doing so, you don't really care about accuracy of these peripheral models. Um, yeah, these peripheral models. So the only item that you actually care about is the, the original item that you're reverse engineering. So yeah, as you can see on the screen, I have made this item uh, out of 10 CAD patches. And I would like to show you another one. This is the hood of a vehicle. Uh, again, the same number of patches, 10K, uh, which is quite a lot actually. Yeah, so let's give the algorithm a moment to transform everything into CAD. It takes only a few seconds. Well, actually it depends on the, the number of patches that you uh, decide to create. All right, so, uh, few more moments, I guess. By the way, I could have selected a particular area of the hood and transformed that area only. But yeah, in this example, I decided to go for the entire surface. So let's see what it does. A few more moments. Okay, there you go. So this is the cat surface, right? You know, this cat surface can technically be exported to any software CAD software package, and uh, it will be quite easy to work with. You can use it as reference for your uh, CAD operations, for your Boolean operations. You can 
cut things with it using all the conventional trimming tools of, of CAD software. There is one limitation though, uh, the number of patches. So even if you go for a very large number of patches, you will probably not be able to reconstruct all the intricate details properly. And with this said, it readily makes a lot of sense to uh, using an overwhelming number of patches because it's going to become hard to work with in, in CAD software. Uh, CAD software packages, they have a certain limit on how many patches it can process. And uh, yeah, you'll need to figure out the exact number um, in your software package, basically. Okay. Yeah, one more thing before we move on. So that one setting that we have, the patch count, it is pretty universal. So whatever uh, reverse engineering software package you utilize, you will have it. And it is basically a setting that controls resolution of your final CAD mesh or CAD surface, pardon. Okay. But if auto surfacing is not an option uh, because, because of the accuracy concern, Artex Studio offers fitting algorithms and basic CAD operations that can help you recreate fairly simple shapes with no external help. You can select particular areas of your mesh using the, the smart segment brush, which I'll show you in a second. Um, you can also create sections and these sections are sent to SOLIDWORKS or any other software package. So this is the, the smart segment brush, right? As the area is selected, I'll be able to fit in a primitive shape into that area. So when you, once you have extracted all the primitive shapes that you need, you can combine them through the use of Boolean, Boolean operations and all the other CAD modifying operations. We have them in Arctic Studio as well. So now let me fit in a plane here. Okay. All right. Yeah, and one more thing, another selection tool. So this time around, I'm going to try to fit in a cylinder into that surface. Let me show you how it works. We have three different fitting modes. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you will go for a particular one. In this example, I'm using robust method, which gives you more flexibility, it kind of disregards all the unnecessary geometry that you have selected. So in this case, I have selected the cylindrical area as well as some uh, fillet area but it will disregard the fillet area. Okay. I can also modify all these primitive shapes and create the so-called free primitive shapes for mesh modification. So yeah, let me create the cylinder and now let me modify the one that I have fit in. So I will increase the diameter and I will increase the height of, of the item, right? Okay. And then what I can do now is I can basically go ahead and combine these shapes. So in this example, I will just modify the original mesh of, of, of the flange and I will use subtract to increase the diameter of the hole. Okay. And you can do these things between two CAD models, two meshes, a CAD and a mesh model. So we're fairly flexible with this regard. And yeah, it allows you to do some minor modifications of the model, uh, regardless of the type of the model. It can be a CAD model, can be a polygonal mesh. So yeah, that was subtraction. Now let me use intersection on two CAD entities. So yeah, I'm gonna select the cylinder and the cone, which I created. I'm gonna show you what it looks like with a preview. So yeah, this is the intersecting area of the two. All right. Okay, so that's, that's kind of outlines what we can do in Arctic Studio. And remember, now we, we are assuming that we don't have anything else. So we only have the 3D scanner and the Arctic Studio software that we use to process your data. And you also can do some basic reverse engineering. With every release of Arctic Studio, uh, we expand our software's functionality and you can expect more useful reverse engineering related functionality in the near future. But now let's say that apart from Arctic Studio, we also have another uh, software solution, which is another CAD software, right, on your computer. This combination will enable you to do reverse engineering of uh, even more complex items. Um, auto surface models, extracted primitive shapes, uh, and even two dimensional sections 
that you create in Arctic Studio can be freely exported into an external CAD solution. And they can be used as a reference for your reverse engineering and 3D modeling. Let's review this kind of scenario. And let's say that apart from having Arctic Studio, we also have SolidWorks without any external plugins as of now. Okay, so in Arctic Studio, I will, uh, I will first of all, uh, export the mesh. Yeah, and I could do that directly into SolidWorks without the need to save it on my computer. I just right, right click and export it. And I'll also export some primitive shapes that I fit. Okay, so these can be used as a reference, like I said. It will not be enough, so I will also create and export um, sections. So cross sections are extremely useful when it comes to reverse engineering of mechanical shapes. So I'm gonna go to measurement and export these two basic sections that I have extracted. Again, it's fairly simple to export them from Arctic Studio. And when it comes to SolidWorks, you can do that seamlessly. And most importantly, you can do it multiple times. So it's like you can have multiple different sessions of export, right? Okay, now I will uh, do some sketching. So in SolidWorks, as well as any other CAD software solution on the market, you will have two-dimensional section, uh, two-dimensional sketches functionality. So I will select the same plane and start doing um, sketching. It is very helpful that I have this section because that's going to help me to, to stay within certain limits when it comes to accuracy. And after that, I'll just create the shape through the use of one of the basic operations. In this example, it was revolution, right? Okay, so that was, this is how the basic shape was formed. And uh, now also some extra features I will extract, a few more sections, which I will further import into SolidWorks to complete the job. Okay, so yeah, and it's gonna result in a fairly accurate reconstruction um, of that uh, shape that you saw us getting with the Leo. So this is the scenario when all we have is Arctic Studio and a third party CAD package, right? So now we assume that we don't have any specific reverse engineering software available. But everything changes quite a lot when you actually get access to specific reverse engineering software packages. Sometimes uh, these software packages are represented by plugins um, for some very famous, like very uh, prominent CAD solutions, like SolidWorks, for example, that we have just seen. And others, uh, they are represented by dedicated software packages. So at this point, I would like to pass the microphone to uh, my colleague Guido Hans from Octon, who will show us more advanced reverse engineering using the best reverse engineering solutions on the market. Guido. Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to have the pleasure to show you, um, let's say two and a half software packages uh, that are dedicated to reverse engineer on a, a quite high level. Uh, I would like to start with Geomagic for SolidWorks. Um, which is a plugin for SolidWorks. So um, if a user has already uh, experience in SolidWorks, he will completely feel at home using uh, Geomagic for SolidWorks because most of the reverse engineering workflow is done in uh, SolidWorks uh, functionalities using features and sketches uh, of solid works so no new things to learn except for handling the scan so handling the scan in here starts with importing a scan mesh data point clouds that can be meshed afterwards and um, the scan as you can see is hmm, imported into SOLIDWORKS and because of Geomagic, um, you can also touch it and work with it. So you're in a discussion with your scan. 
Um, actually, it's just like talking with your scan. So next is that we can classify regions on the model itself. So right now we have uh, quite many triangles and all the triangles are not grouped. They are just hanging around in the uh, in the software itself. But it would much more would make much more sense to uh, arrange them into groups of similar curvature. And that is done with regions. Um, it's done automatically. You can uh, define sensitivity and uh, width of uh, spaces. But uh, in general, that's more or less a no-brainer. You just click on OK, and you will have different regions, different areas on your model. And you can use these um, regions for several purposes. So um, one of the uh, purposes would be uh, generating uh, reference geometries, like, for example, planes. So I could just use uh, extract features to select regions on my part that belong to the uh, the um, area I want to make the reference feature on and simply accept. And here's my new reference feature. And um, as you can see, well, this feature is exactly on a height I'm going to use later on to cut something out of the model. So regions are quite useful. So next thing is that we can use these regions to generate um, freeforms. So there are uh, several ways to generate uh, freeform surfaces. Um, we have two freeform surfaces, one on top of the model. And if you look at this one, uh, this one is also curved in two directions. Um, it could be uh, a sphere or um, a torus-shaped uh, surface, but this one is also freeform. And um, whenever you have a freeform surface on your model, um, it doesn't make sense to try to make this with uh, parametric ways. So you could try to make it as a loft surface, but this is a lot of work to make it fairly accurate. So if it's a freeform, it stays a freeform, and you can generate it as a, uh, as a freeform. Again, we can choose the area to, uh, to make a freeform surface on it. And you can also define if that should be a little bit more accurate or not that accurate, depending on the amount of isolines you're going to create. You can also make it a little bit bigger. And you don't have to look for holes in the surface. So if the region has holes or big cutouts, uh, well, the system is so robust that it automatically goes over these holes and generates a nice surface. Same thing can be done again on this area. Same settings, maybe. There we go. And a second freeform surface is generated. Of course, I could now make every surface as a single surface and try to cut and intersect them uh, to receive the final model. But uh, in here, I just would like to use these freeform surfaces later on. Um, to cut a final shape. So how do we get the general shape? Now this model looks like an extruded model. So we just need a sketch to define the outside shape of it, except for the two freeform surfaces. Now we do have planes in here. Let me make that visible. And we can generate 
a section through our sketch, uh, through our scan. Now, this can be also moved inside the model because right now it's just at the lowest surface and there might be some sliding cut uh, issues in here. But, um, well, we can uh, then define additional, oh, that's the element. Come on, there we go. Um, we just have to define an offset. Let's make it a little bit more above in here. And then you can see that we get a section through our model. This uh, section will be done as polyline uh, in my model. And uh, you will see a sketch appearing automatically. So uh, I'm hiding my, uh, my scan for the moment because it makes it easier to work with that sketch. And uh, editing the sketch, will then let me sketch on the model that you can see on the screen. So I can immediately use my uh, sketch tools in here to generate accurate uh, elements. So for here, for example, I just can reference to my polyline in here maybe zoom in, come a little bit closer and be exactly where I want to be with my, uh, with my arc. Can do the same thing on the other side. Also in here, let's zoom in a little bit just to meet it properly. So of course you don't have to sketch on the model um, everywhere. So we can also stay out of the model, maybe a little bit outside because I want to cut my model later on. So there we are. Uh, additionally, we can also use all the features we do have in our software to generate additional Um, sketch elements. So in here, I'm running into a little problem because this arc is not as accurate as I would like it to be. But since I'm um, bound to my polyline, I can just move the endpoint and move it right into position, which makes the whole thing really nice to use. Uh, finally, maybe another tangent arc from one side to the other side and a little correction of the height. That would help. So this is already done. Down here I have an open contour, but uh, of course we can also trim elements. So just now I have a closed element and by having this done, I can also use my features um, to just extrude my model. Now, because I have made the sketch on a certain height, of my model. Let's get out of that again and show the, the scan again. There we are. Um, well, I can now define how to extrude my model. In here, well, I still know that um, in one direction, I had an offset of two millimeters. So let's give that a two. And in the other direction, well, 
I'm not sure. So I'm just making it bigger than it is. It's easy to cut something, to remove uh, a part, but to cut something, to add a part is more difficult. So with that being done, I have my first basic block of my model. And now the surfaces I did before um, are very useful to cut my shape. So doing that is just using the elements I have in here. So first of all, it's this and that. And if you're cutting it, well, you have to define uh, what to remove and confirm. So we are much closer at our final uh, result. We can repeat that. So that's number one. And we have this little surface we did before. Again, that's the thing to remove and confirm. So the surfaces are not useful anymore, so we can hide them. And we have our basic shape. So additionally, I made this little plane in here and it just takes another um, section. So we go back to uh, the geometric module, you make another section. Well, on that, on that plane, having again a little offset and give it a go. That makes another section in here. And you don't need to sketch the whole thing uh, the section shows. So um, in this case, so let's just hide that and edit that section again. Well, here we are. So you can also use the information on the screen just to refine your sketch. So you could also sketch the good old SOLIDWORKS way, just make a sketch on the screen, work on it, refine it, maybe add some arcs on it. And uh, if you're done with that, you can just snap your sketch to existing elements. And you will see that you have a very nice information extracted for the next cutting uh, workflow. So that is now, of course, you can also add um, uh, dimensions in here, right? So you can use the full um, functionality of SOLIDWORKS in there. So let's leave that sketch and in features, just go to the cut information. So here we just need to have a cut through everything and uh, we can also add if needed um, a draft in there. So this draft um, can of course be switched. I think should be switched. So it goes to the outside. Now let's have a look. Yes. And um, yeah, there we go. Simply through all. Doesn't like me. Ah, okay. Stupid me. That's what I wanted. There we go. 
So uh, I won't make the uh, final hole because of uh, I want to show you also other things. But uh, what I forgot in here, let's correct that. It's also a nice thing because you can correct almost everything. We also have another um, direction in here, additional two millimeters. Also in here, we have our, our draft to the right position. That is much better. That's how it's looking. Um, one thing is missing. Uh, of course, we can uh, make uh, fillets using the whole thing in here, just entering the right numbers. Uh, these numbers can be measured by using other sketches, for example. And um, there we go. Maybe a last one. That's a little bit big. So you're in constant dialogue with your uh, with your mesh. There we go. And um, actually, by using that, you get a nice model. So don't like that. Just wanted to have this edge. Wonderful. There you go. Now, up to here, I have a very nice and uh, clean CAD model. And I can additionally, oh, let's go back to this one. I can uh, additionally in uh, SOLIDWORKS uh, use other features, no? Just looking at my my workflow uh, to to control and to use this part in another assembly and so on. So what I have in here is um, a full SOLIDWORKS model. I can edit it, I can modify it, I can share it with my colleagues and work with it. So that is, let's say, an easy uh, way for, for SOLIDWORKS users who have medium complicated models. Now, uh, what happens if we are getting very big uh, scans or more complicated scans? Um, it might, a little, uh, might be a little bit time consuming using the plugin, but we have other solutions uh, to help you. And that is what I want to show next. Um, so let's get rid of that. And um, I want to save, start with DesignX Essentials. Now, DesignX Essentials is our standalone software with a basic startup functionality. In here, the models can be much more complicated. And because the uh, information extraction is much more comfortable, uh, well, it is also much more efficient to do that. So let's just find our model in here. And um, there is a model I want to show you here. Now, this model is not complete um, in information. We have a huge hole in here, so it's not scanned very thoroughly. Um, and one should think that maybe we have to scan again, but sometimes the model scanned is not available anymore. So what can we do to handle this model? 
And here the design X functionality kicks in. Um, first of all, we can generate regions uh, also in design X essential, but because it's the essentials uh, version, well, this these regions cannot be done automatically. We have to uh, do the regions manually. Therefore, we have a nice tool set for selection. So just by inserting certain regions on the model, which takes a little bit more time, but which makes you also look at your model uh, a little bit more in detail. Um, so it's not bad sometimes to do manual regions. Um, now it helps you to analyze what is happening on your model. You can also use other selection tools, for example, rectangle selection tools with select through options to just generate more regions. And if you move the mouse pointer over such a region, it tells you, well, I'm a cylinder, I'm a plane. Oh, that's a cone. That's another cone. I thought that was a cylinder, but no, it's a cone. So you get some information of your part and you can also select um, the triangles of a region very easily. Oh, by the way, that's a freeform. So now let's start the reverse engineering process on this part, quite complicated with a big missing data. Well, there's one thing I want to add on my screen. So let's go back and select this side, make a region in here also. So first of all, clearly to be seen, there's a draft on it, but I don't know how big that draft is. But I have a planar region in here and I have my reference plane down here. So I easily can measure it using the measurement tools from this planar region down to this plane, I have 94.05 degrees in draft, uh, uh, sorry, in, in total angle. So I have a four degrees draft, the 05, I will forget, that's construction intention. So let's get rid of that. So I know I have my four degrees uh, in here. Uh, maybe for later. Then I can start making construction geometries in here. So I can add vectors on that cone using the fine cone axis function. One in here and another cone, one in there. So I have my axis of this revolutionary um, part of the scan. There it is. Additionally, I can also move my sketch planes into the axis. Uh, that is making a plane, just selecting the vector and the plane. So don't need this one. Sorry. Too many vectors selected. So let's do that again. One here, one there. And the method here is projection. Simply click and you have a plane exactly matching the vector. So I have a perfect sketch plane for this conic shape. Of course, I can repeat that also using the second vector, same plane again, same method, there you go. And then uh, I also can uh, directly start. So if at the moment nothing else is to be done, uh, I can simply start in doing my sketches. Um, there are multiple ways to generate sketches, but in this case, I would like to generate a silhouette over my entire shape, because it's not really good scanned. Then hide my mesh, and here I have the outside of my body. And that is more or less rectangular. And I can just snap my rectangle, for example, in here to my global origin, or I can snap it to the magenta outside 
of my silhouette. Additionally, in uh, DesignX, I have the possibility to show the deviations of my sketch towards my model. And in here I can see, well, I have a quite rough line with several um, deviations in here, but I can snap it to any point I would like. In here, there is an equal distance. Uh, this is construction intention. I just want to chop it off that way. Well, and with this rectangle that can also be dimensioned very easily, like that. You can also change the dimensions if you like. With this model, uh, with this sketch, I can do my very first model. And this is now uh, something new. We haven't seen that before. Um, that is extruding our sketch, but not just straight up. We can extrude it up to a region. So I generated this freeform region and I can use that as an upper limit of my extrusion. So I can do that by tolerance or by number of ISO lines, but I, for this, I would like to have that as um, by tolerance, so tens of a millimeter. And by clicking OK, I have my first solid body which is in here. It's nice and smooth. The hole is automatically filled. And this is something that saves a lot of time. So next one would be in that we can make sketches again. And I prepared these sketches already. So on the first plane, um, let's start a new mesh sketch. I get another profile. In here, I don't have any information, so I'm free to do whatever I want. And in here, looking at my uh, section, in this case, I can just convert the rotational axis of my cone, make that a helpline maybe, and then just do whatever I want. Maybe another rectangle. Don't need this one, don't need that one, but these two lines are useful. And I can just copy these segments of the intersection uh, polyline by double clicking. This line is exactly in the right position I need it. Can be trimmed and cleaned up. And here's my first rotational profile. Of course, I have to move that close to the end of my scan position. And in here, I just want to be, uh, make it longer because this cone, just to show you, is hidden in this rib structure. So keep that and in model, revolve it. Of course, not 360. But we have a lot of possibilities in here and we can just revolve it as much as we like. So just let's have a look. Maybe make that a little bit deeper, can merge it immediately. There we go. Wonderful. Same stuff on the other side. Sketch again using mesh information. Now let's make a new sketch. There we go. Another section for the next cone. Again, hiding what is not important at the moment. Here's our second vector, also converting it, just repeating the first one. And in here, There's something special. This cone has an end surface and it looks like a line, but it's something else. We will recognize a little bit later. So first of all, I'm going to make a mistake. 
I'm just snapping the line in here because I think this is the end situation on my cone. Well, let's trim it up to now, nothing special. Exit and revolve. Also in here, just looking at the model makes it easier to determine how much I have to rotate it in both directions. One, two, go. So, looks sort of okay-ish. If we switch on the meshes and use our accuracy analyzer to have a look at it, we see that in here we have sort of an arc where we have met our accuracy. That means this is not a conical shape or a, a, a planar shape in this case. That's something else. So right now, um, one could think, well, we have to start over again completely. No, we don't. We can just change our setting a little bit. First of all, the sketch, we can just make this a little bit longer. And that's it. So makes our cone longer. And I don't want to merge that cone immediately. So just edit it, switch off merge, and I have a separate solid body in here that can be cut. So next one, um, that's one of my set of rules I made up. Uh, reverse en uh, engineering is 50% magic and 50% cheating. Now we come to cheating. Just looking at the sketch, uh, at the scan in a point based model, we can turn it until we get a very dense linear shape visible in here. And if you have that linear shape, there it is, then you have an extrusion direction. And we can make a reference plane using um, view direction. There it is. Just somewhere in here. And we can use this newly created plane, which is somewhere in space, to make the end information of this cone. So let's come back to some nicer uh, view and make another mesh sketch in here. You can move that a little bit so you get better information. It will be projected into the sketch plane, of course. And in here, we can add an arc. Let's hide a model in this area. This arc can be resized so it's not forgetting its information. There we are. And it can be extruded as a surface. In here, I would be lazy and just make it as big as possible in both directions using midplane. There you go. Several possibilities are, uh, are we uh, are now here. I would just use um, the cut information, have that as a tool, that as a tar, sorry. That's a tool, that's a target. And I want to keep this one. Now I have my special end information in here, which is much more accurate. I don't need the surface anymore. There we go. Uh, of course, I still have two solids. And in this case, we can use Boolean to just merge both of them into one solid. And we have one part again. So there is this rib missing. And uh, in here, 
we have to find out more information on our part. And uh, well, let's do that. I can make a vector using the find cylinder axis. Now, and uh, because of the special way how projecting a plane on a vector is done, I have to uh, put this into a base plane. Uh, so I can make a nice intersection on my cylinder in here. So I just want to have another vector by projecting it into this plane. And then I can just move over to plane and project this plane into the vector. There we are. So now I have the center of this rib represented by a sketch plane. Wonderful, that's what I wanted. And um, then you can just go to sketch, select your sketch plane. And by looking at the, in, um, at the section line, you see there's a hole in it. So in here, we didn't have enough information in the scan, but we don't need everything in here. We have this little bit and we have a little bit on top here and I have a perfect line uh, to use. This line can be copied. I can invent other lines on my model. And of course, I can also use tangent arcs as I did before. In here again, I have my issue that this tangent arc is not accurate enough, but I can switch on my accuracy analyzer and move the line until it perfectly fits into my design. All I wanted to see. Uh, in here, of course, um, there is a fillet. You can just adapt the fillet into your model as easy as that. If you don't like the dimensions, you can correct that. And of course, let's trim our model. So we have a nice sketch again. So this sketch can again be extruded. So what I'm going to do, um, I don't know how big this part should be. Uh, forgot to measure, don't have any information on one side, so I can't measure. What can we do in here? Very simple. Uh, DesignX helps us to decide how big the whole thing should be. So we can use mid-plane because it's a symmetrical uh, feature and move the extrusion until we get a match. And here I have a match with this side surface. Can correct that to a value that fits my mood. And using merge, I can add that rib into my model. Now you could think that, well, we measured something in the beginning. I have a draft uh, on top of here of here of four degrees. Yes, you're right. That draft can be added using various methods on my model. So I won't have any issues in here. Four degrees, there we are. And then, well, yes, but it's not uh, an edge up here, it's a fillet. Well, we can also have that as a fillet, but not as a constant fillet because in here the fillet is bigger. So can be done very easily using a full face fillet where you just have to select the boundary surfaces of the model. There you go. And always there's a possibility to check deviation if you're accurate enough or not. So one thing is missing, 
<clears throat> and this is this little piece. There's almost nothing of that piece in our model. So in the scan. Well, but the little bit we have is enough to reconstruct that part. Uh, again, it's sketch based. Well, let's do it on the little top of uh, this here. But as we can see, it says I'm a cylinder. Well, looking on the side of it, it almost looks like a plane. And I want to abuse it as a planner feature. So what can we do? In properties, it says that this region is a cylinder, but I can force a computer to accept it as a planner feature. Now it's a plane. And because it's a plane, I can sketch directly also on this region, which is pretty cool because I don't have to make um, a reference plane on it. So let's start with a sketch on that region. Get a silhouette a little bit below, but wait, we had our draft in here. So we can add a draft angle of four degrees and get the information of the virtual edge of the side surface with the top plane. Now, um, playing a little bit with the software gives us more information. So let's have a look. There's vector one. It's also important to hide things if you don't need them because it makes the whole thing a lot easier to work. Converting entities is easy. Just right mouse click and we can copy the center of our cone. And that can be then moved to another position. It can be also copy moved to another position. And we can invent other lines, maybe rectangular to the already existing lines. So these can be then also snapped to the shape. In here, I can't snap it, but I can think of a position that fits in here. Can also trim that just to have something like that. And this little feature now is everything I need to reinvent that shape. First of all, I want to extrude it, not in that direction, but into the other direction and up to a solid, up to this solid. There we go. Additionally, I want to have that draft angle of four degrees to the outside. That looks quite nice in here, but as you can see in here, there is a problem. Now let's just accept it on the first one. Second, I just want to change the draft of this one. So nothing more easy than that. Simply change it. The draft surface in here is, if you look, maybe 30 degrees. Let's start with 30. And let's have a preview. In here you can see, well, it there is a slight angle in between here. So maybe it's not 30, maybe it's 25. Again, now the outside of the scan and the drafted surface are parallel. Well, there we go. Can accept that. Using deviation for body, and the mouse pointer in here tells me that I'm still two millimeter off because on top of uh, this here, um, using the standard draft, I made a little mistake. So making mistakes in Design X is not an error. Sometimes it's useful to get more information. So we can immediately go back into the sketch and just move the line accordingly. So still off a little bit, nothing easier than that. 
zoom in. Yes, I was off a little bit. There we are. Perfectly. So, and then I just have to make some fillets to finalize the entire model. Starting with a full face fillet again from one side to the other side. Okay, trying that on the other side again, we will maybe run into an issue again. And you can see that this fillet stops at this position. That's not as horrible as it looks like because you just have to switch some parameters and all the way and it works all the way through. Um, some more things you can add constant fillets. So you get also a little fillet on top here. And what about that? Well, I don't know. This doesn't look like a 10 millimeter fillet, but I don't know where to find out. Very simple in here. The computer finds the perfect position for uh, for or the, the perfect number for the fillets. If you don't like that, you can change it any given time. There we are. So that is this little one. And then you can just start through. You can just select edges, maybe add some more there, and let the computer tell you the radius of the fillet. There we are. 12.99 whatever, maybe 13. And so on. So we have one here. That's a bigger one. Accept. One here, find out. Computer says I'm 11. There we go. And so on. So you immediately know which radius you have in the according fillets. So, and that makes the whole workflow much, much more efficient because you don't have to measure all that stuff. So I think I'm through with my fillets except for the last one which is here. Somewhere. Don't know why it doesn't like me at the moment. Ah, there we are. Didn't want to select this, just this one. Could also select that one. So I have everything selected. And here's my final model. So, um, still looking at the um, accuracy and except for some surfaces, I choose to not be that accurate because they have maybe been bent. Um, everything else is in shape. If you're not satisfied with the resolution, for example, with this fillet, simple double click on the fillet and then you can choose another parameter to make it more accurate. No, come on. Make it a little bit bigger. There you go. So in dialogue with your result, you're always able to correct 
um, parameters and make it much more accurate and you don't have to be afraid um, of making a mistake. Simply, more or less playfully, get your results. Now, in here, we had a limited tool set and uh, the final uh, thing I want to show you is Geometric Design X without essentials. It looks from the beginning just the same. Same surface, but it has much more functionality. Uh, in here, uh, getting information from the model is, oh, I was unpatient. Don't click on it before it completely starts. Um, in here, getting information from the scan is put to the limit. So in here, I have, I think that's the one, a very complex shape. And I have a repeating pattern. Now, what would happen if I would reverse engineer only one blade and this blade was damaged by uh, deassembling the machine. I would multiply the error of that blade and have a final product that would be not useful at all. So in here, I have auto segmentation back again. Computer is able to sort out all the informations on my blades and the rest of the part. And now I can, after the computer is done with it, uh, I can use these regions to get more information about my uh, part in total. How is that possible? Now, very simple. Um, in polygons, there's something like average meshes. And in here, let's have a look from top. Uh, in here, I can select my regions of the part one by one to generate an intermediate mesh of all these regions, which is pretty cool because you can sort out also errors in this process. So therefore you have to define the axis of revolution, you have to uh, get an axis center and you get have to get the offset angles. Well, you can calculate them, but you have also your preview uh, function in here. And this sorts out all that stuff automatically. Uh, there's also a possibility to refine the alignment so to uh, with respect uh, of the shape but i want to have also the position uh, averaged let's go to the next stage now the computer calculates an intermediate mesh of all these regions that takes a while because it has to um, align all these measures on top of each, uh, each other. And uh, also it has to do an uh, error calculation. So what we get as a result is not only um, a new mesh, but we also get a chart of errors. Or we get modern art. That happens with my computer only, wonderful. I'm doing the same thing again now, and you will see now it works. It's always the same. If you want to have modern art, well, you can do that also. So just selecting everything again, from now on it will work all the time. Wonderful. Um, that's what we have, maybe, I select the first one as a start position and 
again, let's calculate all these numbers and go to the next stage. That should actually do the job. Here we are. It has been faster. And here we have a chart with all the errors that appear on my intermediate mesh. And by looking at it, well, let's find out some outliers. This one is a tenth of a millimeter. Don't like it. And that was the worst one, I think. Ah, oh, here, there's another one. Don't like it. And here. So these were slightly bent. I just have to recalculate the result once again. And there we are. I have a new average mesh. It's a new mesh body. If I hide the original, here is my new mesh. This can also get a new region. Well, I'm doing this one uh, more manually by inserting a region on top of it. And I can make my um, solid of the blade now using the standard workflows. In model, I would use this shape uh, just to make a mesh fit surface. Well, there is a, a workflow by moving it on the screen a little bit and applying some movements of the basic little plane in here. But that looks good. You can also um, set the resolution in here to uh, the values how you like it. You get a preview. You can uh, get a deviation analysis on the model in here. Well, that is pretty accurate. And yeah, then you can accept that surface. In here, I have the top surface of my blade. Now the other side, I could also make an intermediate mesh in there. Um, I'm not doing that because of time issues. Uh, in here, I have a much more bended surface. So in here, I just would like to define the outside of the plane and fill the rest with surface information. Therefore, we have a 3D mesh sketch. And in there, we can just add splines using also the edges of our region. So we are sure that we don't move into other surfaces. The computer, I'm just doing that with several few intermediate points. The, uh, the software will enter more points for accuracy issues automatically, so I don't have to care about accuracy. These splines will stick to the surface. Wonderful. And this 3D mesh sketch can be used in model using a legacy boundary fit. That generates a surface perfectly on the model. And uh, well, you can do that also by allowable deviation. And simply give it a go. There we are, a new accurate surface. So on the mouse pointer, you can see the deviation on the specific point. Now 30 micron, it's not that bad for that scan. Now this surface is a little bit too small, of course, and we have to extend it. Um, can do that in all directions, as you can see here. That's a little bit too much. That's nice. 
So I have the top and the bottom surface of my uh, model in here, but they're still a little bit missing. And I can use um, my basic planes, if I find them, here we are, to add more information on my part. So for example, I could add a sketch as a mesh sketch right on top of my part. I could also make a little silhouette, but in here I still have enough information. So what do I need? First of all, the outside and the inside of my turbine blade. Well, this is basically, can be done in, in many ways, but I'm just making two circles and cut them down. So I have one here, somewhere inside my body and one there exactly matching the outside. And just using some help lines, you can make two arcs from that using the power trim option. Just clean up the model and delete everything you don't need. There we are. Now these two, uh, two arcs can be extruded as surface bodies, mid plane, and big enough that they intersect everything. Doesn't look so bad. Additionally, I want to have the lowest point on my blade. Now that is a little bit more tricky. Let's have a look. So by just looking at the right one, Yes, um, by looking at my blade here, I can make a new sketch as a mesh sketch on that plane and move the information a little bit down. Now you can see that I get a little information of the outer edge. But if I make a silhouette on my part, um, I'm just getting all I want. So I just have to move it like that. Maybe a little bit lower. And I get the complete outside of my blade in here. And this complete outside is just an arc. So simply double click on this one and maybe correct the sketch a little bit. Here we are. Of course, I can resize that the way I want. And also extrude it again. So it's just simple operations I'm doing here nothing really special. That's what I want. Hiding the mesh also helps to find out if everything is okay. So what is missing is the top surface and for the top surface an extrusion in Z direction is maybe not the best because um, I would like to have another silhouette of the blade. So what can we do? Very simple, we can make another sort of sketch. And that is quite unique. It's not a uh, translated scan, but it's a rotated uh, sketch. Let's have a look. We have a rotational method. We can select the uh, axis of the rotation and we can select the base plane. And instead of translating the section plane through our model, we can now rotate it like that. Of course, we have to select the target, which is the main thing. 
just want to see the outer extents I have in here. And then I can rotate the section through my model. Now, of course, I don't want to rotate it and have another uh, stupid section in here, but I want to have a silhouette again. So everything which is inside will be projected into my model. And here I have the top line of my rotational profile. Well, that looks like a line for most of it, except for the top feature in here. And that may be a tangent arc to this one, which can be, of course, resized again. There we are. Let's resize that also to the other direction. And you can, you don't have to in Design X, but you can also make a rotational axis in here. So by revolving that, we get a revolving structure, can use mid plane to a certain amount like that. Maybe not so much. And maybe let's do that in both directions. That's nicer. Wonderful. So what happens is that now my entire model is encased in surfaces. And there is a function called solidify that does the job of intersecting and cutting for us. And the final model is done automatically. So again, we can use our uh, full face fillet functionality to finalize the blade. If it lets us, tangent propagation is important. There we are. And on the other side, we can, of course, do the same. Just to make the rounds. There we are. And this is a perfect blade being really accurate and um, on the inner of the averaged meshes. Outliers are sorted out before. Now, finally, I'm not going to complete it because the rest is just a standard revolution. Uh, finally, we just want to have it as a circular pattern and uh, just by entering the rotational axis, we can have, or we can sort out the number of blades by finding out if it fits or not. I think the 16 blades was correct in the beginning. Nope. That 20. 20 blades, wonderful. Here we are, and there we are. So you can imagine that finding out such a complex contour in a perfect quality. So looking at that is, there's no wrinkle, no nothing in it. Um, would take some time if you do that manually and not supported by software. Um, I don't want to stress your time so much, uh, so I will end my little uh, demonstration in here. And um, yeah, that would lead over in the question and answer uh, part, I think. So I'm handing back to uh, my colleague Anton Popov, the, uh, who did an incredible, fantastic uh, uh, introduction of reverse 
engineering. I really was uh, uh, very possibly uh, pos positively um, impressed by this uh, introduction. Really good, uh, good, uh, good job. So handing back to Artic. No questions. Oh. Okay. Ah, back again. Yeah, here I am. Yeah. Yeah, Guido, thank you very much for the kind words and for the thorough presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, before we move to the Q&A session, I can tell that we do have some questions for sure. And before we move on to that part, I'd like to kind of sum up everything very quickly. And uh, the summarization is, generally speaking, complexity, shape type of your item and accuracy requirements define the tools that you need to use and therefore the software uh, that you'll need to employ. So for very simple projects where accuracy is not really the case, uh, you can just free model around your mesh and that way you will be able to extract the shape. If uh, you do care about accuracy and you, do, you have some uh, organic shapes, then you'll need to go for something like a combination of Arctic Studio and SolidWorks or SolidWorks and SolidWorks and uh, Geometric for SolidWorks plugin. And for the most accurate and effective reverse engineering uh, of objects of virtually any shape and high complexity, your best bet is to rely on the dedicated software packages, um, such as DesignX. Definitely, that's that's one of the best one on the market for sure. Yeah. So before we go, we really appreciate you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the recording of this event will be sent out to you shortly, as well as some of the models that we have used. If you happen to have any questions, feel free to get in touch with either the Octon team or the Arctic 3D team via email, right? We're always available and accessible. And yeah, thank you very much. Until next time, bye-bye.